Good morning or good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Jennifer McGregor, and I'm welcoming you to, to today's screening and conversation. And I, my collaborators here are going to um, introduce themselves as well. Um, hello, I'm Richard Ibgi. I'm Mary Lou Lament, and uh, we are joining you today from the uh, Grantham Foundation for the Arts and the Environment which is located in saint anne de grantham in Quebec, in a rural area of Quebec, Canada. Hi, I'm Hazel Wheeler. I'm uh, the lead biologist with the uh, Eastern Logger Hedgerike Recovery Project with Wildlife Preservation Canada. And I am contacting you from my living room in uh, <laughs> Guelph, Ontario, which is uh, about an hour outside of Toronto. And um, I neglected to say that I'm joining you from my apartment in Northern Manhattan, and I'm the senior curator at Wave Hill. And this is part of our experimental virtual presentation of Eco Urgency, Artists Make the Case. We had originally planned to, to show the videos of Richard Ib Ibge and Mary Lou Lemons from the Violence of Care in our on-site exhibition in the spring, but when it was canceled due to COVID-19, we pivoted and decided to work with each of the artists from the exhibition to do a virtual presentation of their work. So today we're going to see a screening of banding young eastern loggerhead shrikes at the Cardin Alvar, um, the, this video, and it will be followed by a conversation. So I want to just remind everyone that if you have any questions, you can put them in the comment section of the um, of Facebook and we'll answer them later. Um, so part of our interest in this whole topic is to see where do artists and biologists and scientists intersect. And this is a really interesting example. Um, Richard Igby and Mary Lou Lemons have developed a collaborative practice that spans multiple media. They have exhibited widely and had a major solo exhibition at the Bemis Center for Contemporary Arts in Omaha last year and are re represented by Jane Lombard Gallery here in New York. Um, Hazel, as she mentioned, is the lead biologist for the Loggerhead Shrike Recovery Program. And we're gonna be seeing her in action in this video at the Cardin Field Station in Ontario. And it's just, it's really exciting for me that we can be um, screening the work that happens in other places that we in New York would not otherwise know about. And in particular, this, this species that is on the brink of extinction and how people are helping to, to understand what is happening um, with this bird. So um, that is a little bit setting the stage where we're coming from and our guests are gonna talk a little bit before we start the, the video. So I'll just give a, a short introduction of uh, the series. Uh, so this video we're gonna see is part of a series of work that's entitled The Violence of Care. And it's a project that explores some of the entanglements between humans and birds uh, with the aim of creating a kind of thicker, more complex vision of what cohabitation and care between species can mean. And this is a project we started in 2019 and that's ongoing. And it involved uh, looking at different landscapes of care that connect uh, the zoo, the field station, uh, the conser conservation center, but also the backyard. One of the situation that we thought was really uh, important to uh, pay attention to in this project was a situation of care uh, that involves a species that is endangered or as we mentioned, uh, Jennifer, at the brink of extinction. And we were fortunate enough to uh, connect with Hazel Wheeler, who's the, in charge of the Loggerhead Shrike Recovery Program, and to meet with her team and to have the opportunity to film some of the work that they do at the Cardin Alvar. And so we realized two videos with them. Uh, one of them is the one we will be showing today, and that's a 21 minute video. And we'll be showing a, actually a, a long extract that's about 11 minutes. Um, 
I don't know if Hazel would like to speak a little bit about the logger strike, loggerhead strike. Yeah, so um, just to give a little bit of context uh, about the species. So the Eastern loggerhead strike, it was designated endangered in Canada in 1991. Um, Wildlife Preservation Canada, we've been running the rec recovery program since 2003. Uh, and it's really, we're trying to keep the birds on the landscape. So part of what we do is keep track of the wild birds. So field biologists will be out looking for the birds, tracking their uh, reproduction. Um, we also do a captive breeding and release program, which is the subject of this video. So we produce young birds in captivity and then we release them into the wild to help bolster the, the numbers in the wild. And I mean, at this point it is, um, they are in a fairly precarious position. Uh, there are only a couple spots left in Eastern Canada where you can still reliably find them breeding. One is on the Cardinal Fire where this video was taken. Another is um, the Napanee Limestone Plain, which is out uh, towards Kingston. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's an, it's an interesting thing because this, this subspecies of bird, so there are a number of different subspecies of loggerhead shrikes across North America, but um, it's likely that this subspecies also would have been found in New York State, um, but uh, at this point they're they're effectively gone um, from the state. So you know the work that we're doing here in Ontario might actually um, benefit the uh, the New York um, ecosystem as well. Um, yeah, they're a really cool bird. They're very small, you'll see, but they're also fully predatory. So as you're watching this, just think about this bird that only eats other animals. Um, it is that fits nicely in, in one's palm. So it's, that's kind of a quick and quick and dirty of the recovery program. <laughs> Thank you. So let's let's start the video. <laughs> This one, yeah, so eight, seven? Yes, okay. There's a needle. Yep. <laughs> Or three terraces to put. Length twenty six point seven seven. Band number two four nine one zero four six eight eight. off all the light greens. We'll hope we don't have a mass breakage of light greens. <laughs> this one is weirdly small. <laughs> like yeah, some of them are like, like yeah, yeah. some of them are weird. Cut little. Weirdly short. Yeah. Thank you. 
images as well. Mm-hmm. That's nice. Mm-hmm. Okay. It's also got a bit of a weird tail. R6 isn't, or R1s is intact, so short tail 90. Long tail 96. Zero, muscle, zero. Lean cord, 100. Weight in primary, 55. <coughs> Looks male again. Mm-hmm. Nice Goodness. Dress. Which is good because... We were releasing mostly females. True. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's get some males out there. Yeah. Yeah, true. Picture? Thus far, most of our birds have been female. Okay. Are you a fool? No. <laughs> <laughs> Not this time, friend. <laughs> Thank you. So, I mean, I appreciated the liveliness of the O'Brien's one. It's like, you know, right. touristy. They like, get you, you know, calm. He's singing songs <laughs> and yeah. they sing. But this one, um, she had a little dog, like a little, a little uh, collie. <laughs> a little life jacket on. His name was Arwen. Aww. And she's training it to sniff whales. What? So, the? <laughs> okay. so cool. It was like, a, you know, if, if it smells like either whale, like breath or feces, then it, just like alert. Like looks oh alert. my gosh, <laughs> that's actually awesome. Have you noticed? It's a whale rail. <laughs> that's so cool. Yeah. Arwen whale sniffer. That's her name. <laughs> An Arwen, that's a great name. Yeah, too. right. I seem to miss my car. Well, no tail me- measurements. A oh, poor thing. Uh, yeah, I want to go back to Newfoundland and do a gross morning. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. yes. I drove through just to drop off um, some equipment to a bio there, so mm-hmm. I didn't get to tour again. Mm-hmm. And uh, just the drive through here is dying. It's so oh. beautiful. Oh, my gosh. Insane. Well, this is amazing. It has everything. It really does, yeah. yeah. It just needs to fix its roads up because it's the and parks and infrastructure, too, infrastructure is yeah. like a It has mess. everything but jobs. Yeah, like the wildlife yeah. sector is non-existent. It's like tragic. And the caribou are dying from a uh, bot fly or whatever, the worm in the brain. Oh, no. brain worm. Yeah. yeah. Um, bot fly is the one that's like 97. In your tissue, right? And 56. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're getting kind of wrecked right now. I saw one, the one caribou out there and I was like flipping out, which was. Um, mm. Yeah, and moose everywhere. You got like 10 minutes outside of St. John's and you're like, yeah, yeah, male? Moose. You, you saw half a moose? Yeah. <laughs> so it disappeared into the... Oh, well, I was like, oh, that sounds like a roadside issue. No, 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 no it, was, it was just walking into the woods. Oh, okay. Why I saw half of it. Oh, gotcha. Oh, okay. We got a tour out there one of these days. Let's go. Let's just be I've, I've done as of August the <laughs> going on At zero. Life. I'm supposed to be going up to Manitouage in September. So that'll be interesting. It's like an 11-hour drive. Muscle one. Thank you. <laughs> just go just right over it. That. <laughs> and miss it entirely. Yeah. 
Oh, jeez. Um, yeah, in. could you? You didn't have your opportunity to stage. To prep. That's okay. It's a good, good poke. Scott, this is our last day. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh my gosh. Could I be annoying and take a picture with them? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah. I must hold one. <laughs> yeah. You can, you can hold a shrike. Yay! Thank you. You have to get bit by. He can bite me. Oh, <laughs> I don't even care. I will not he even feel it. Seems pretty nice. <laughs> yeah, he seems. So for those of you who may just be joining us, we're, we just watched banding young Eastern loggerhead shrikes at the Garden Alvar. Um, and that was a, a 11 minute excerpt from a 22 minute video. And um, I wanted to start our conversation um, just with some observations that it's just, it's so interesting the way we start with watching Hazel, um, the lead biologist, Hazel Wheeler is, with just one bird sort of gently do, taking the measurements, sort of we're all just really focused in on that one bird and then the way that it opens up to the rest of the team. And we're really observing your, your work as you, your labor as you work together to um, measure and band these young um, shrikes. And um, I just, I wanted to first start with a question to you, Hazel, is what was it l- like to be, ha- I mean, it, it all feels very natural and it all feels um, like no cameras are there and just um, how, how, it, how it is to be having your work um, presented in this format. Yeah, um, it's really interesting. Uh, so yeah, I mean, it's I've I've been working with the program um, for about seven years now. So over that time, you know, I've handled hundreds of shrikes. So yes, it it is very much just muscle memory at this point. I can go through it fairly quickly. Um, yeah, I think the the interesting thing with having Richard and Mary Lou there was 
uh, I mean, it is a little bit of added pressure. Um, and I think that was maybe what, what you heard at the start is just trying to do everything just very professionally and get it all done as like, we're always trying to do everything very professionally as quickly and, you know, taking care of the birds. But uh, as we kind of relaxed into having them there and having the cameras around, um, that's kind of when you can you know, start to hear everybody chatting more. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's also watching it this year because of course, you know, um, we are affected by COVID just as everything else is. So our field season looks very different. Um, and I'm not actually going to be doing any banding this year. So watching that video was kind of like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm missing that right now. We should be doing that right now. Um, can, can you just tell us like what, ha I mean, it's, it's, we kind of watch you leave the structure and go wherever you go. What happens next for the birds? Uh, so after they have been banded and sampled, um, we, we keep them at the field site uh, for about a, a, at least a week total. That gives them time to acclimate to their surroundings. Uh, and then the next step would be um, their release. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a very um, low, pressure, uh, low pressure activity for them. We just kind of open the doors and then step back and let them come out in their own time. Um, but yeah, so that's the next step. And then once they're released to the wild, I mean, it's at this point, you know, we've done everything that we can do to make sure that they are the fittest, healthiest birds that have the best chance of survival. Um, we give them a little bit of food uh, for a little bit after they've been released. And then uh, then it's, it's all up to them. Mm -hmm. um, and Richard and Mary Lou, I wanted to ask you about your, 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 um, well, a couple questions. One is like how you got connected to this particular project. And I also wanted to ask you about your, um, your filming technique, which is very, um, it's kind of fly on the wall, kind of just like putting us right there in the, in the moment and, and just, you know, giving us an eye into something that we would normally never, never get to see. And um, I like that there's not any explanation. It's just like putting us into that, that place of the observer. Do you want to talk about how we got connected and I could talk about sure. it? So I, I really learned about the uh, Lego Hedge Fright Recovery Program on the web. Mm -hmm. uh, at the time, that was about a year ago, uh, we were doing a residency in Bemis. So we were in Nebraska. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was actually uh, mostly looking at grassland birds and uh, trying to learn about populations and how they were impacted by agriculture. And then I realized that there was this program in Ontario, uh, which was working for already a long time with uh, this bird species, which also used to be common in Quebec and which isn't anymore. So it's a little bit like the New York situation. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then I learned that they had two field stations in Ontario, and uh, I was able to uh, contact Hazel, which was amazing and responded to our emails and our interests uh, very promptly. And as we came back to Canada, we were able to uh, work with them. Um, with respect to our filming technique, um, we're not uh, professional filmmakers. Um, we, it's, it's one of the, the medias that, uh, that we uh, use quite often. Um, and I could say that we, we use video in um, two different uh, ways or two different styles. Uh, one of them will be to, and, and both emphasize the body uh, a lot. Um, and uh, one of them is, um, kind of an experimental, uh, in an experimental approach where we will uh, set out certain parameters and use the body as a, a performative device to capture certain ideas that we're exploring, whether these ideas are um, the impulse to be more and more productive or other types of uh, uh, actions. Um, however, we also use it um, to kind of document and uh, when we document, we um, 
tend to do it in a more or less tableau style. Mm -hmm. So uh, of the um, seven videos that we presented uh, in this series, The Violence of Care, uh, the one that we presented is the only one which has a moving camera. Um, all the other ones have a very fixed perspective and just captures whatever activities um, are, uh, are, are, are being uh, documented. In this one though, because of the nature, the proximity, uh, we were actually in a very small cramped space. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, then we, we kind of tried to follow the, uh, the movement. Uh, but as you mentioned, we, uh, without any explanation and uh, with as little uh, editing as possible. So this is the only one of the seven that has editing as well, mm -hmm. uh, because the whole, the whole film shoot lasted over an hour. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, we decided to cut it down to 22 minutes and then just for the sake of mm -hmm. um, this conversation, we cut it down to 11. I should add that the, um, the other one, the, the, the other video that we filmed that's also presented in the Violence of Care is the soft release that Hazel just presented. Oh, right. um, so then we'll see, a, a, and that one has a fixed, uh, a fixed image and we could see the biologist uh, going up to the cage, opening up the, the door, um, setting down some food, and then for about 20 minutes or so, we see a couple of birds coming out, um, but the, most of them stayed in. And uh, I guess, as Hazel mentioned, they, they come out at their own pace when they're good and ready. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanted to just talk about like, how would someone normally see this video? Today we're seeing it, you know, and we're on Zoom and and Facebook and we're having a nice conversation, but if you were presenting it, would you be presenting it in a, in a um, gallery setting or a museum setting or how would you want um, people to, to experience the video in the optimum sense? I think there are many situations that could be uh, interesting. And uh, of course we mostly work in galleries and museum and art institutions. Mm -hmm. But I can imagine uh, somebody looking at it on the web or on their phones or mm -hmm. uh, having a more like using it as a tool to have a discussion about issues of uh, declining uh, biodiversity or mm -hmm. what is it practically that the biologists do in the field work. So I think it can circulate in many ways. And for me, there's not only one way that would be valid. So I, I would like to add that um, a, a large part of our work is sculptural and uh, in our sculptural work we tend to try to materialize abstractions, whether these abstractions are diagrams or uh, charts, uh, maps of territories, and we'll, um, we'll do them using very simple means, but um, there's something very, like dealing with abstractions, there's something a little bit cold, though they are very colorful and yes. um, and uh, it's enjoyable to look at. There's a very strong aesthetic dimension. The, the nature of the work is kind of cold and uh, very often we'll present videos that use the body uh, and present them in the same space to kind of create a balance and a tension mm -hmm. between the coldness of the, um, of the content of the diagrams of the, the sculptures mm -hmm. with the body um, and the tactile nature of the videos. And uh, so the natures will, the, the videos will often have, uh, will show nature or people working in nature. And so the two together kind of uh, balance each other out. I might use a different adjective. I think cold is not the right adjective. Uh, I think it's more that the kind of abstractions we deal with are reductions. So mm. they're simplified uh, representation of reality. They're models, they're like diagrams. And this simplification uh, really benefits by being counterbalanced with complexity. And that's mm -hmm. what you see. It's like going from the idea of working with uh, birds and to actually seeing people handle the bird and the whole like centrality of it, but also the complexity of handling a real bird right. that uh, is moving, might not agree with what yeah. you're doing. And so that complexity is really important. Thank you. Um, Hazel, can you, could you envision in your world a, a way that this video could be presented? Um, 
mean, I look for any opportunity really to kind of bridge the gap between what I do and the public. Mm -hmm. um, so when, yeah, when, when Richard and Mary Lou came to me, um, I was, I was very prompt in my reply. I was very excited <laughs> at the, the opportunity to create this kind of interdisciplinary dialogue. Mm -hmm. um, it's not often that I talk to an artistic <laughs> crowd. So, um, but uh, yeah, no, I do think, I do think that there is a lot of, even my friends and family, there's a lot of mystery around what it is that I actually do. <laughs> uh, so it's an amazing glimpse into the world of what it actually means to work in hands-on wildlife conservation. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And, you know, giving people the opportunity to step into that experience without mm -hmm. actually having mm -hmm. to go out into the field. Yeah. Uh, I, I think it's it's incredibly valuable for creating a connection to nature um, mm -hmm. that I think is really what we we need to foster to you know to get to a place of more broad scale uh, uptake of conservation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because this is a, the the field station is so remote, you can't have people there. I mean, that sort of defeats the purpose of yeah. what you're doing with the birds. That. Um, I we also do sometimes sorry no you go <laughs> yeah i mean it's there is it's there are certainly more remote stations you know this yeah. one is it's maybe like an hour and a half from toronto um yeah and uh actually one of one of the people that you could hear in the video she was uh a friend of one of the field biologists mm -hmm. that you know the, again it's like you know, there are some opportunities but yes it yeah. is certainly it is a small it is a small group of people who yeah. do actually get to come up and see them. yeah, yeah. So this, um, this video is part of a, a series called The Violence of Care. And so I thought maybe we can talk about what that means, the violence of care. And also I think something that sort of threads through the other videos too is like how people, how we and people as people and animals and mostly birds are are interacting and how are we, what are we doing to sustain the bird and how, and I think that the, the video itself, we see the, the lengths that you're going to, to study this population. Um, and maybe Mary Lou and Richard, you can talk a little bit about how you came to this. I mean, because as you were saying before, you do deal with abstraction and this is in some ways an abstracting to making an idea very concrete, I guess. Yes, actually, I, this is an important point because I think uh, the maybe one of the starting point for this project was the fact that in our uh, world, we read a lot of theory, we hear a lot about uh, questions of like uh, interdependent uh, lives, entanglements, and a lot of really important and fascinating discourse uh, about how we live with others and how we can start to think differently about how we live with others. But uh, sometimes uh, all these words and theories are, feel disconnected from actual practices. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we wanted to do was to go and look and see what does this mean concretely in different spaces and different contexts that are each complex and problematic and very specific with specific birds because each bird is different. If you uh, start thinking about uh, backyard chicken, uh, you have a very, very different story of entanglement with human lives than with a loggerhead shrike. And so this concreteness was something that we wanted to bring to those questions. Mm -hmm. Maybe you want to talk about? Yeah. yeah, with respect to the violence, um, obviously we, were, we, we chose um, a strong word uh, which resonates um, uh, and also which um, uh, which creates a tension with the uh, the second word care. It's uh, we don't often associate violence and care in the same um, sentence. And uh, obviously, we did not want to imply that uh, people were being violent to the birds or to the animals and species that uh, that were involved in the videos. But um, it kind of came from an idea that um, we had read uh, one person named. Uh, Pre the, uh, the, 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 the thank you and um, 
Can it's you just repeat it, it, it? Just repeat that the, again. The Maria, Maria, Puig de la Villa Casa. Okay. And um, it's something that uh, she wrote, which was, uh, in an, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but uh, care is nothing is, is never anything that's uh, simple uh, or innocent um, for those who give it, nor for those who receive it. And um, it, care in, in that sense, it's, uh, it's a problematic and it's an ethically charged uh, mm. Often, often involve very uh, ethically charged situations. For example, in the loggerhead strike uh, example, um, from what we had understood, um, there are some captives, some, some birds, uh, some strikes that have been held captive um, and who are dedicated to breeding. Uh, in a way, um, their way of caring uh, or the, the way that humans have placed them in the position of caring is to sacrifice their own freedom and their own lives for the sake of uh, the species survival. Um, or uh, another example is um, we had a, 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 a zoo uh, keeper uh, cleaning out the uh, the exhibit for the uh, the mirror and the um, uh, and, and the puffin uh, exhibit at the Omaha Zoo. And here we have somebody on his hands and knees for hours and hours every day scrubbing this exhibit with something about the size of a toothbrush. Uh, while these puffins are swimming around uh, around him, and um, you know, so on the one hand, there's care being involved, but like the puffins didn't ask to be there, and they certainly wouldn't want to uh, stay there. And, uh, and and this was his job, you know. This is something that he's being paid for, and um, so these are not ethically um, simple situations of benevolence or altruism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, which are two adjectives that we normally associate with care. Mm -hmm. I just want to remind our um, those who are listening, if you have any questions, um, please feel free to put those in the Facebook um, comments and we will um, certainly answer them. Um, Hazel, I, did, I was wondering if you had anything to add to that in terms of the sort of ethics of care. Yeah. Um... It is a really complex thing when you're dealing with captive animals. Um, the thing that came to mind for me, um, I think it's coming up in a lot of life, but <laughs> is, is the question of intent versus impact. Um, mm -hmm. And clearly our intent is very good. Mm -hmm. uh, and there, are, there is always, I think you do always need to be asking the question of if your impact is lining up, at least in some approximation mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. that intent. Um, and I know that, you know, there is certainly, like in that video that we watched, you know, netting the birds <laughs> with a pole net. Yeah. yeah. There's, that is an example of, yes, that's could be considered fairly violent. Um, so there's always the uh, assessment of what we're doing to make mm -hmm. sure mm -hmm. that we are approaching uh, and acting with the, with the strongest ethical ground that we can. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, there are definitely times that things come up that we do need to reevaluate and then modify. Um, so yeah, it's an interesting, I actually, when I, when I first saw the title, uh, I was like, ooh, and I was like, oh, no, <laughs> that's, that's good. Like it's, it really, it really does bring to mind that kind of that juxtaposition um, and highlights the, the, the need for a continuous um, ethical examination of the work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, uh, if I may uh, add sure. something is that uh, whenever we work with, um, with professionals, uh, whether scientists or zookeepers or uh, whoever, uh, we try to, well, first of all, we always uh, discuss with them what we would like to do and what we expect uh, from them. Um, and also we will always show the video to them to get their mm -hmm. approbation before we exhibit them, mm -hmm. um, uh, which we did in this case. Mm -hmm. uh, however, one thing we That's did good. not do. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. Actually, actually, the 10 minutes we edited out, we don't want to show Hazel. <laughs> But the one thing that we did not do um, in this case 
uh, was run the title of the series by any of the participants. Right. And it's something that we, we kind of felt a little bit funny about because uh, we realized that um, the stamp that we were uh, putting onto the whole series affected the reading uh, mm -hmm. of the individual mm -hmm. videos. Mm -hmm. And um, and so we uh, we wondered actually what Hazel or other other participants uh, how they reacted to it and um, nobody you know mentioned like we, we let them all know uh, but nobody actually uh, mentioned or wrote to us about it so we figured that uh, maybe they were understanding that uh, we were taking it um, let's say somewhat metaphorically or it was they weren't looking at it literally and. Uh, mm -hmm. But yeah, it's, uh, that's a really good point about the title. Mm -hmm. So did that come um, later on for you, the violence of care, um, as you were, you know, working on the various um, videos? Yeah, it, uh, it developed, the whole project actually developed through encounters with people who have concrete practices of care. And as mm -hmm. we met different people and we discovered different situations, we started to see uh, what the questions were and what the whole could be, uh, what kind of question the whole could be brought under. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe one thing with the violence of care is that uh, it's a, the title was inspired by a book about uh, the extinction of birds and different stories about the extinction of birds mm -hmm. uh, written by Tom Van Doren, who wrote a, a book called Flight Ways. And, he talked about uh, regimes of violent care and he was specifically looking at how in very complex situations with uh, birds that are on what he calls like the dull edge of extinction, uh, often humans who want to intervene to help uh, to has, assist these birds in their uh, survival and having good lives uh, need to uh, make certain gestures it could involve uh, other species that have become like, let's say, parasitical to the nest of uh, a bird population that is threatened. And then how do, you, how do you keep this other species from doing this? Mm -hmm. And so he was looking at all these different uh, decisions, but also there is another, uh, I think, important thread to our thinking about care, which comes from feminism and feminist theory mm -hmm. and feminist mm -hmm. practice which always uh, has highlighted the fact that we shouldn't think about care as something innocent and just benevolent and out of love and affection, because mm -hmm. generally women will be put in positions where we expect certain things of them, certain levels of care, and these uh, places can be places of domination or exploitation. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's a notion that needs to be uh, really uh, not idealized and not seen mm -hmm. necessarily mm -hmm. as wholesome or good. So that was the other uh, dimension of that thinking about care that mm -hmm. I think is important as well to bring all these interesting ideas that were developed in feminist theory and to use them to think about interspecies uh, relations and care. Mm -hmm. That's really fascinating. When you, um, exhibited in Bemis, did you, were, I believe that people could see, could they see all the videos at once or? I think there were six out of seven six that were shown. That you had, that you had. Um, so, were, so in that case, people are really being able to see this as a grouping. But they were, um, uh, <clears throat> the videos were uh, scattered around uh, the, the gallery space. So at any one moment, they could usually see one um at a time except for the the, the diptych of the loggerhead strike which they could see side right. by side and that was to um first of all give them each an individual character that you could just focus on one at a time but also like i mentioned they, before they um they kind of uh, circled around all of the um not colder sculptures but um <laughs> <laughs> what was word you used? The, the, re the redactive sculptures. Yes. I will be reprimanded for that uh, later. Uh, have you on them? Which are, people can see on your website, and you have a really good um, sort of summary of that exhibition and that work that people can see there. 
Um, and there was actually a really great article in Hyperallergic about the exhibition, which is, I believe, how I found out about you folks in the first place. Um, and I wanted to, to note that we will be doing Eco Urgency um, Artists Make the Case as an exhibition next year. And we're looking forward to working with Lehman College Art Gallery on it and being able to present all of these videos at once um, next year. I have a question that's popped up, which is um, someone would like to know what are you guys working on now? What is everyone working on now? Maybe Hazel could talk now that she's not at the field station. What are you working on now? <laughs> uh, yeah, well, in I your mean, living room. <laughs> yeah, I'm. Uh, I'm. I'm working on making my dog and cat get along. Um, <laughs> Good luck. I, the 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 loggerhead trike recovery program continues. Uh, I mean, it's 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 impacted me in that I'm not going out into the field as much, but we do still have field biologists out there doing some work, um, and we are doing some releases of captive birds just on a much smaller scale. Um, the tricky thing, the especially tricky thing this year is uh, our, our birds are bred at a number of facilities. So there are a couple here in Ontario, so Toronto Zoo, African Lion Safari, but we also have US partners, um, mm -hmm. so Smithsonian Conservation Biology Institute down in Virginia, um, Nashville Zoo. Uh, this year, the National Aviary in Pittsburgh is going to be joining the program. Um, but of course, uh, there's the, the borders are closed right now. So none of the birds that are bred there, we weren't sure if we'd be able to get them up to Ontario for release. So we had to kind of, um, yeah, there was a lot of contingency planning. We've kind of just bred as much as we can. So the program continues and we're uh, looking forward to getting back to full steam next wow. year, hopefully. So what is happening to the birds that are bred um, this year? Uh, yeah, so in it, we've really just kind of in the States, they've bred just as much as they can hold. So they'll just become part of the captive breeding population. Um, in Ontario, we are doing some releases because we can. So um, yeah, some birds will be retained to add to the captive population. And then we will have uh, just a smaller scale release towards the end of the summer um, of those juveniles that we, we can release. I was thinking also the fact that the loggerhead is uh, a migratory bird uh, that probably complexify like when you can uh, release them like you can't release them at any time in the year like well there's winter but there's also the migration I don't know does that impact? Yeah absolutely so really um, the end of August that's considered the end of our field season we want to have all of our birds out of the cage really by mid-August, so they have a little bit of time when the, the biologists can still keep an eye on them and give them a little bit more food. But yeah, there's definitely a timeline and even in the captive breeding um, process, you know, there is, there is a deadline that is uh, in June, basically, if, uh, if a pair that we have, if a breeding pair that we've put together, if they've not initiated a nest by this date in June, then we have to separate them to make sure that um, there's enough time for the young to get to an age where they're independent and where, where they're where they'll be able to survive in the wild. It really introduces this idea of ethics in a yeah. pandemic, um, which I'm sure is one of those like 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 everybody's dealing with things in a new way and probably something you didn't ever anticipate. <laughs> I don't think any of us really anticipated any of this. But, um, I know. I think working working in wildlife conservation, you you learn to just kind of roll with things that come up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yes, this is certainly absolutely new for us, but uh, it'll all work out. You need to you need to be a little bit positive. And actually, this reminds me one of the reason why we wanted to make this project was to balance our interest in abstractions and abstract systems that impact our relationship with the natural world or with one another. But also we wanted to uh, see if we could bring some, some hopeful stories, let's say some gestures that 
sometimes we feel crushed by like ideas of massive extinctions or biodiversity loss. And it feels just like a weight that there's nothing to do about this. And I think we wanted to bring all these practices that are very concrete, that are very, uh, that, that use different technologies that involve different forms of labor and practices and processes and to show them to give a sense of possibility. Mm -hmm. So, And that, that really comes across in the group of, of, of videos that you've made. So what are, what are you guys working on? Uh, right now we're, um, we're in, in this beautiful residency that you're at. <laughs> this beautiful residency, which does not allow for a, a simple video chat because the lighting is so strange because there are very, very large windows. So as Mary Lou said, we're at this uh, foundation, which is fairly new, called the Grantham Foundation for the Arts and the Environment. Actually, we're the first residents. Yeah, we're the first residents. <laughs> <laughs> And um, so we're here for the month to prepare work uh, that will be um, exhibited in this very space hmm. uh, beginning or towards the end of September. And um, the work that we're working on now, uh, it's always difficult to talk about work when it's um, still uh, hmm. underway, uh, but we're working on a series of new pieces um, some of them sculptural, some of them photographic, some uh, video um, that deal with our relationship to the land, uh, particularly um, rural agricultural land. Um, so one work is very historical and, and it talks about the, the beginning of colonialism in particularly in Quebec, but in North America and the way that um, the, the, the fragmentation of land was used as a means to occupy and, um, and settle. Uh, so mm. it's uh, how cartography and uh, surveying, uh, at that time, mm. new techniques in surveying uh, and, and the precision that uh, they were able to uh, get through surveying, um, how that was used to, to divide up the land in very precise ways that uh, made them um, e more easily to settle by, um, by abstracting all of the social and uh, other forms of relationships that pre-existed pre on that land. As a means of appropriation and also as a means of eraser of other ways of making territory. So we're, that's one big word. And otherwise we're looking at a much more contemporary form of abstraction of our relationship with the land, which is the uh, financialization of agricultural land in some regions in Quebec, mm -hmm. where in the past 10 years, uh, different speculators have started buying uh, arable lands and reselling it and increasing uh, the value of land and impacting, uh, of course, what is the kind of agriculture that is being practices and the rural communities. So like as a result of the 2008 financial crisis, a lot of uh, mutual funds and other forms of uh, corporations and other types of investors started to look at uh, agricultural land as a kind of safe place to uh, place their money. And, uh, and so that is, uh, that's a, a global phenomenon uh, in parts of Africa and uh, parts of South America, and, uh, but all over the world. Uh, part of the problem is the international uh, dimension of that, that you have foreign companies or speculators buying Mm -hmm. land in Africa, for example, to ensure also um, food to uh, their local population. But it's also, um, it goes beyond this, uh, the foreign dimension. So in Quebec, there's a lot of this speculation um, in certain parts of Quebec, and most of it, though, is uh, um, done by local speculators. So there's, that's, that's, another, that's another piece. <laughs> wow. We're uh, balancing all these abstract and more uh, critical projects by meeting farmers and meeting people who do permaculture mm -hmm. and different form of like uh, caring for the soil mm -hmm. actually. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So organic gardening and we've been filming uh, those really earth-centered, soil-centered mm -hmm. practices that aim to create uh, a very different way of living uh, with others and inhabiting the land. 
Wow, that sounds that sounds amazing. Um, well, we're getting to the end of our time, and I want to really I want to thank all three of you for joining us today. And it's been a really super fascinating conversation, and I'm excited that we're going to be able to show the whole suite of videos next year. And um, maybe we'll, Hazel, we can bring you back for an update on what happened um, the next year. With <laughs> yeah, um, absolutely, I'd love to. I want to just um, remind everyone that this is being recorded, so it will be um, something you can view on our website and um, I believe also on Facebook. And next week, we're excited about a conversation that Eileen Jang Lynch, our, our curator, is having with um, Alison Mortsugu about her paintings, which specifically deal with the ash borer. And in some ways, the relationship between that devastation and the devastation of the pandemic that we're all experiencing now. So um, we are also collecting all of the programs that we're doing on our website. So um, at any time, you'll be able to go and see the other um, conversations and walks and other things that we're doing. So anyway, thank you all. And um, it's, been, it's been a thrill to talk to you. Thank you, Basil. Thank you, Jennifer. It was great. Yeah, Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. <laughs>